the Knights Templar, a secret brotherhood born in the throes of the Middle Ages, only to vanish after two centuries in existence. Of these men who left their mark on history, remains the legends that made them famous. Their white overcoats bearing the iconic red cross. The riches they amassed. Their discipline and ferocity in battle. These were the elite troops, the special forces of the 12th century. After 1,000 years, mysteries still surround the myth of these soldiers of Christ. Are they priests? Are they monks? Are they knights? What are they? As an English chronicler, he called them a certain new monster. In this episode, we discover the truth behind the tragic end of the Knights Templar. It speaks of considerable preparation and considerable logistics, all the more impressive because the Templars didn't suspect it coming. Thanks to the renowned experts on the history of the Order of the Temple, along with an investigation where the only written evidence of this period is preserved, we reveal how the King of France plotted to bring down the Order of the Temple. The accusations were so outrageous and they'd spread around Europe pretty quickly. We can't, you know, the, the Knights Templar are found to be doing all of these very strange and very unchristian things and everybody was in a state of shock. They were a part of the past. There was no way for the Templars to skip the trial and for many of them the death. From the arrest and torture of all the Knights Templar of France to the execution of their last Grand Master, you will discover one of the most Machiavellian plots in history. They would be accused of a heinous crime, sodomy. They are also criticized for worshiping an idol, something that could be associated with witchcraft, with magic. This head could have feet, be bearded, be oozing, have two faces. It's a crime against the faith. The Templars are accused of denying Christ. They deserve the stake. This is the true story of the assassination of the Templars, knights who became too rich and too powerful, and whose final members were burned at the stake before the people of Paris. Acre a city on the eastern Mediterranean coast, situated north of Jerusalem. In the month of April 1291, the Mameluk Sultan, Al-Ashraf Khalil, lays siege to the city with his army of 220,000 men. Inside are 30,000 inhabitants, including 14,000 soldiers and a few hundred Knights Templar. These fighters are members of the Order of the Temple, a brotherhood born at the beginning of the 12th century. Their mission? To defend Christians in the Holy Land. But nearly 200 years after their creation, and despite eight crusades, Christian holdings in the East have largely disappeared. Surrounded by Mongols and Muslims of the Mameluk dynasty, they are under constant attack. Acre is one of the last major Christian cities in the East. And it is here that the seat of the Templars has been for a century. On May the 18th, 1291, the Sultan's soldiers launched the assault. Guillaume de Beaujeu, Grand Master of the Order of the Temple, dies in battle. Ten days later, Acre falls to the Muslims. All of a sudden, the Holy Land was lost. This was the last Christian stronghold. It was at its greatest extent, probably in the early 1140s, maybe. Ever since then, it had been slowly getting more and less and less Christian as they were losing land and losing cities. The loss of Acre was, you know, a disaster. Everybody was slaughtered. 
the fall of Acre in 1291 is very much the end of the Crusader states. The few remaining towns and cities that are left to the Crusaders on the coast, they are evacuated almost immediately afterwards. At the end of the summer of 1291, the Muslims retake all Christian holdings in the Holy Land. The surviving Templars retreat to the island of Cyprus, which becomes their new headquarters. When the Templars were forced to retreat to Cyprus, this was not the end of their struggle for the Holy Land. Almost immediately, they started to lay plans, seeking for options for getting back. When they left Acre, the Knights Templar had already premeditated their departure and the Order's treasury had been evacuated. The Order's archives had also been evacuated. And it was in Cyprus that a new Grand Master was elected in the early spring of 1292, Jacques de Molay. Jacques de Molay, 23rd Grand Master of the Order of the Temple, now in his 40s, having spent 20 years fighting in the Holy Land. Jacques de Molay is a warrior. This is not a man of diplomacy. He is not good at politics. He is a soldier. He believes that the Temple Order can have only one mission, the war to defend Jerusalem and the faith. As the Knights Templar suffered a total rout, Jacques de Molay now faces an immense task ahead of him. The Templars had been founded as a crusading order to defend the Holy Land. So the loss of the Holy Land meant that suddenly the order had no reason to exist effectively. As early as 1293, Jacques de Molay traveled throughout Europe to convince the Pope and the kings that it was possible to reconquer the Holy Land. For 15 years, he worked tirelessly to maintain an armed presence on the island of Cyprus, ready to go back into battle. In 1306, an event will alter the status quo. The new Pope Clement V commissions Jacques de Molay to write a report on the necessary conditions for possibly launching a new crusade. When Clement V wrote to him in 1306 to ask his opinion on a new crusade, we can assume that he was very happy with the circumstances, that finally this policy that he had supported for about 15 years was going to have a successful outcome. This report is kept at the National Archives of France in Paris. The words of the temple's Grand Master are clear. Jacques de Molay maintains the belief that Christians can return to the Holy Land. We must organize a great crusade to destroy the enemies of the Christian faith. If we could have 12 to 15,000 knights and 5,000 pedestrians with the help of God, we will be able to recover the entire Holy Land. I also recommend that you arm 10 ships as soon as possible. I will arrange for the money to pay the fees. With his field experience, he realizes that sending small expeditions is not enough to overcome the situation and that it will take an army of boats to retake a minimum of positions. He sends his report to the Pope, then leaves Cyprus at the end of 1306, arriving in France at the beginning of 1307. Jacques de Molay arrives in France, ready to do anything necessary to promote his new crusade. However, he doesn't know it yet. He will never again return to the East. He is the 23rd Grand Master of the Order of the Temple, and he will be the last. Behind Molay's back, two men have been plotting in secret over several months to realize one of the most Machiavellian plans in history, to bring down the Order of the Temple. These two men 
are Philip IV, King of France, also known as Philip the Fair, and Guillaume de Nogaret, his closest advisor. At the time, Philip the Fair has been king for more than 20 years. He is known as the Iron King. The personality of Philip the Fair was a mystery perhaps even more impenetrable than the mystery of the Templars, a man of terrifying intransigence and an appalling temperament. Philip the Fair is both authoritarian and a propagandist. He knows very well how to manipulate public opinion, a modern king. Alongside Philippe the Fair is Guillaume de Nogare. Guillaume de Nogare is a very versatile, royal civil servant. He manages economic affairs, financial affairs, political affairs, conflicts with local churches, with bishops. So he's kind of an all-around prime minister who has a global vision of the kingdom. The reasons which drove these two men to destroy the order of the temple were multiple. The first, and most obvious, was money. Philip the Fair had a very aggressive and a very dynamic territorial policy, as much towards the south of France and Lyon as towards the north, towards Flanders, and therefore he's in a permanent war in the early 1300s with the cities of Flanders and the Flemish nobility, and these military expeditions cost him lots of money. In 1307, the Kingdom of France was on the verge of bankruptcy. The King of France was in debt up to his neck with foreign bankers. The French crown's finances were weak, and the Templars were an obvious source of immediate wealth. If he just can, you know, take the order down, he's got access to their money. Well, well that's what he thought. For Philip the Fair, given the disastrous finances of his kingdom, the money of the Knights Templar represents a windfall. However, the main reason which drove him to attack the Order of the Temple is more political. What the King of France is seeking at the beginning of the 14th century is to assert his authority at any cost over his country and to the detriment of one man, the Pope. The Order of the Temple is a means for Philip the Fair to obtain, above all else, what he has sought since the beginning of his reign. Absolute power. Philip the Fair is trying to create a new kind of state where the king is above anyone. Which means that uh, a king is the main power in his land and that uh, he receives the power directly from God, not from the Pope. There was no need uh, for the middleman, the Pope as a middleman between uh, God and the King. Of course, the Templars could not fit in this new modern world, new vision. They were a part of the past. If Philippe's looking for a way to erode the powers of the church, perhaps the Templars, who have a substantial presence in the Kingdom of France, become a viable target, particularly given the collapse of the position in the Crusader States only a few years previously. L'affaire du Temple. The Temple affair was devised by the French monarchy to weaken the papacy. It was aimed against an order dependent on the Pope alone, who was the best hope for the Holy Land and one of its privileged creatures. To take down the Templars, Philip the Fair and Guillaume de Nogare carefully formulated their plan. Several months before Jacques de Molay's return to Europe, 
they secretly warned the new pope, Clement V, that scandalous rumors were circulating about the order of the temple. According to these rumors, the Templars were actually heretics. Heresy is one of the most terrible crimes that there was. It's a crime against faith. The Templars were accused of denying Christ, of maintaining initiation ceremonies where one would encourage the brothers to indulge in sodomy with each other. The Templars, instead of fighting for the faith, would offend it on a daily basis. Rumors about the Templars had been circulating for, you know, most of the time the order had been going, whether there was any truth to them or not. They were also, you know, fanatically secretive, but they were in their own bubble, effectively, of privilege. So once these accusations started to filter out, I think the kind of the secrecy, again, worked against them. Um, because people didn't know what the Templars did in their initiation rituals. Guillaume de Nogaret collects testimonies, accumulates evidence, false evidence, constructs arguments, a list of possible accusations against the Knights of the Temple. It's in 1306 that all these accusations, these rumors that are circulating, will grow and grow. Arriving in France, Jacques de Molay hears of these rumors, but is unaware that they originate from the king himself. He senses that his order of knights is threatened. He decides to counterattack. Jacques de Molay asked the Pope for an inquiry, led by the Pope himself, into the honor of the order and its practices. Jacques de Molay had uh, warnings that something was going on, but I think because he'd been a lifelong Templar, he thought they were untouchable. I mean, and for 200 years they had been. They were answerable only to the Pope. So I think Jacques de Molay underestimated Philip the Fair quite badly. He thought, well, we're Templars, I'm the Grand Master, nobody can touch me except the Pope. But what Jacques de Molay doesn't know is that Philip the Fair and Guillaume de Nogaret have no intention in waiting for Pope Clement V to investigate. In the greatest secrecy, they have already drawn up an arrest order. Several original copies of this order are kept in the National Archives of France in Paris. Written in Latin, the words were chosen with the greatest care, and the charges are extremely serious. In the arrest order, there are five main justifications which are advanced. First, something implausible that happens during the initiation of a new Templar. A brother who is received is led behind the altar. The master then shows him the cross, the figure of our Lord Jesus Christ, and makes him spit on it three times. Secondly, there were some other troubling practices for the candidate to be a new Templar. The officiant who will dub him as a new Templar kisses him at the base of the spine, just above the buttocks. A very bizarre, obscene kiss. Thirdly, the Templars would be encouraged at their initiation to have homosexual practices so as not to unite carnally with women. Then the master tells him that according to the statutes of the order, if a brother wants to sleep with him carnally, he is obliged to accept. So they were advised to commit an abominable crime, which all heretics are charged with, sodomy. They are also accused of worshipping an idol, something which is in the realm of witchcraft and magic. And the final justification, the brother chaplains of the Order of the Temple would not consecrate the host at the communion of their members, meaning not an orthodox practice during the course of a mass. A set of heterodox practices is swept away to justify an accusation of heresy. Whereas the truth cannot be fully discovered otherwise, and since a vehement suspicion has spread to all, we have determined that all the members of the said order of our kingdom shall be arrested without exception whatsoever, 
held prisoner and reserved for the judgment of the church, and that all their property, movable and immovable, shall be seized, put under our hand, and faithfully preserved. The arrest order indicates that the operation must remain an absolute secret. On September the 14th, 1307, the royal order was sent to all regions of France and delivered in person to the bailiffs and seneschals, the king's representative officers. At the task of preparing one of the greatest police operations of the Middle Ages. One month later, throughout the Kingdom of France, and at precisely the same time, the king's police arrive at the gates of each commandery of the Order of the Temple. The Templars were arrested suddenly on the orders of Philip the Fair on Friday the 13th of October 1307. And this is uh, thought to be the origins of Friday the 13th being unlucky. Um, it certainly was a bad day for the Templars in France. They were all arrested at dawn throughout France. It speaks of considerable preparation and considerable logistics, all the more impressive because the Templars didn't suspect it coming. Jacques de Molay, 23rd Grand Master of the Order, is also arrested. The soldiers appeared at dawn on October 13th at the gates of the Paris Temple, which was a fortified district just outside the capital of France. They arrested all the Templars present. There were 138 of them. From that moment on, Philip the Fair and Guillaume de Nogaret knew that what they were doing was outside the law. By arresting the Templars, Philip was technically acting outside his jurisdiction. The Templars were an order of the church, therefore he had no right to arrest them. He, however, claimed to be acting in the church's interests by arresting the order. That was how he justified what he did. In anticipation of any reaction from the Pope, the King's men must obtain quick and incontestable confessions. To achieve this, Philip the Fair and Guillaume de Nogare have an unmatched method. Torture. The interrogations begin on October the 15th, 1307. They weren't officially supposed to spill blood. So what they would do, they would use the racks so and people would be stretched or arms would be dislocated. Squeezing fingers with, you know, pliers and so on. So although they weren't officially allowed to cut somebody open with a knife, they could do pretty much everything else. It was pretty nasty. The record of the interrogation of the Templars arrested in Paris is preserved in the National Archives of France on a scroll of 44 goatskins sewn together and on which are transcribed the confessions of the prisoners. On the scrolls, the signatures of the royal notaries in charge of writing the report are identified. We have a very short summary of a day of interrogation with three questions that come up. Did they spit on the cross of Christ? During the initiation ceremony, did they kiss the candidate on the top of their buttocks? Did they receive instructions to unite carnally with their brother knights? 
So, to be clear, we're in the fabrication of mass confessions in order to be able to take legal action afterwards. In the middle of the scroll is the interrogation report of the most important prisoner of the investigation. Check the Moli. In the name of Christ, amen. May it be known to all that in the year of our Lord, 1307, the 24th day of this month of October, appeared before us brother Jacques de Molay, Grand Master of the Order of the Knights of the Temple, present in person, who swore on the Holy Gospels of God to speak the truth, pure, simple, and in its entirety. Even today, no one knows to what point Jack Dumoli was tortured to make him say the following words, transcribed in the interrogation report of the King's notaries. I, Jacques de Molay was admitted to the temple at Bonn 42 years ago, and the one who admitted me brought a cross on which Christ was represented and commanded me to deny Christ, whose image was there. And I reluctantly did so. I was commanded to spit upon the cross, but I spat on the ground only once. I was never told to unite myself carnally with brothers, and I never did. Jacques de Molay agrees to say, or rather said under torture, that yes, he was asked to deny Christ, and that he did so, and spat on the cross. That was enough for Guillaume de Nogueray to take out this text and say, voila, the Grand Master of the Order of the Temple has confessed. And in fact, depending on the level of resistance to torture of the Templars, they almost all confessed. In Paris, of the 138 Templars interrogated, only four refused to confess to the crimes of which they were accused. 121 confessed to having denied Christ, 111 to having spat on the cross, 109 to having carried out the obscene kiss on the top of the buttocks. Elsewhere in France, some Templars will also confess to having worshipped an idol called Baphomet. What is a Baphomet? We don't even know. And when you have a description, you have everything. This head could have feet or not have feet, have two feet, have four feet, be bearded, be oozing, have two faces. We're obviously in perfect confusion, which simply shows the imagination of the Inquisitors. In all the regions of France, without exception, all Templars will confess to one or more crimes of heresy. You could say, well, the sheer number of confessions indicates that some at least must have been guilty, or you can say, well, hang on, they're being tortured, of course they're going to confess. The link between torture and the guilty verdict is very strong. The Templars were basically saying what Philip wanted to hear effectively. Thanks to these large-scale confessions extracted under torture, Philip the Fair and Guillaume de Nogaret achieved their first victory. They announced to all of Europe the result of their investigation. The Templars are heretics and must be eradicated. Pope Clement V is cornered. Although the King of France has acted outside of the law, these confessions are far too serious for the Pope to stand by and do nothing. On November the 22nd, 1307, he publishes the Bull Pastoralis Preminentiae, which is addressed to all the Christian kings of Europe. I, Pope Clement V, demand and exhort that your nobility prepares to give the order to seize all the Templars of your territory, as well as their movable and immovable goods on the same day. Clement V was confronted with an almost impossible situation. The Templars had already been arrested. Many of them had confessed under torture. And he probably was trying to save at least a part of the Templars as well. 
because uh, the Templars of France, they were already condemned and there was no way for them to skip the trial and for many of them the death. The rest of Europe's sovereigns are skeptical of the Templars' guilt. And while all the members of the order are arrested, questioned, and tried in different countries, the conclusion nearly everywhere is the same. No one finds anything to reproach the Knights Templar. When the papacy initiated the Templar trial across Western Christendom, the Templars were put on trial in multiple countries, including the Kingdom of England, King of Aragon, parts of Germany, Italy, and elsewhere. The main finding from all of this is that no Templars confessed. In Spain, the king and the population defended their own. There was a trial, but there was no defamation. In Venice, the trial was in the hands of the Doge, who said, ours are very honorable. We are absolutely sure that they are not heretics. And there was not even an arrest. The king of Cyprus defended his own. The most glaring example is England. The English police were unable to cross-examine and obtain a confession or a suspicion of evidence. There had been no use of torture, and there had been no work by the interrogators. But Philip the Fair and Guillaume de Nogaret had no intention of letting the investigations carried out in other countries disrupt their Machiavellian plan. The machine has been set in motion, and there was no stopping it. The damage was done. It didn't really matter if the English Templars weren't admitting to spitting on the cross. The ones, the guys in France were admitting to doing that, and that was enough to bring the order down. During the first six months of 1308, the King of France and his lawyers put pressure on the Pope. They insist on the seriousness of the confessions obtained and assert again and again that the Templars are guilty and that the King has acted in the interest of the Church. The Pope was not fooled. He suspended the inquisitors of the Kingdom of France. We therefore had a sort of balance of power that was established in the spring of 1308 between the Pope and the King of France. This is the period of great tension. This is where everything is played out. In the summer of 1308, Pope Clement V decides to take back control of the legal situation. He appoints his own interrogators to interview the Knights Templar and asks Philip the Fair to let them see the prisoners. The men of the King of France selected 72 prisoners to send to Poitiers for questioning. The highest dignitaries of the order, including Grand Master Jacques de Molay, are interrogated in the royal fortress of Chinon. Vatican's apostolic archives, where all the documents of the history of the Holy See are preserved, the reports written by the cardinals in charge of the investigation of the Order of the Temple can still be found. Exchanges between the Pope's investigators and the prisoners are faithfully recorded on these pages. When they asked him, seeing that he regretted his actions, why he had agreed to do such things if they did not correspond with his faith, he replied that to enter the order, it was an obligation. margins are still some notes indicating sodomy, initiation rite, idol worship. The Pope's men tried to determine whether or not the crimes accused by the King of France are true. However, Philip the Fair authorized the Cardinals to question the Templars only in the presence of his men. Threatened, the prisoners are incapable of denying their heresy. All confess. 
The Templars who speak know that the royal police are watching them and that they will be returning to the royal prison, so considering the tortures they may have suffered, the torments they have endured for months and months, it's very likely that they did not try to retract their confessions and in the end continued taking the line that was established, confessing the minimum but confessing to be left in peace. When the Templars were interrogated in the spring of 1308 in Poitiers, the Pope realized that all the inappropriate gestures which formed the basis of the accusations against the Templars belonged to a practice. The document says, Usus Ordinis Nostri, or Modus Ordini Nostri. Therefore, a practice, a rite like in the military, but which had no connection with theology or heretical doctrines. So the Pope was convinced that, yes, the Templars may have been guilty of several faults because they tolerated the existence of these inappropriate ceremonies, but that these faults were not of a heretical nature. At the end of these interrogations, Pope Clement V decides to write down his decision concerning the dignitaries of the Order of the Temple, seen by his cardinals in the prison of Chinon. The original of this document, entitled The Parchment of Chinon, remained lost until the beginning of the 21st century. The statement leaves no room for doubt. Pope Clement V gives absolution to the highest members of the Order of the Temple. The wrongs they had allegedly committed are thus forgiven and expunged by the Pope himself. For Jacques de Molay, Grand Master of the Order, we have decided to grant him the benefit of absolution according to the canonical form of the Church. We bring him back to the unity of the Church. We bring him back to the communion of the faithful and we allow him once again to have the ecclesiastical sacraments. The Pontifical Commission in charge of instructing the trial of the Order of the Temple was set up in 1309. Its members heard hundreds of prisoners who returned to testify, but this time not in front of the King of France's police, but before the men of the Holy See. As they can testify freely without being tortured beforehand, without being in the custody of the royal police, most of the Templars who come to testify retract their confessions, tell how their initiations take place, and everything seems normal in what they tell. And like that, dozens of Templars testified before the Pontifical Commission, before the Cardinals, by describing the tortures they suffered, by describing the deprivations to which they were subjected. Locked in a well without eating, without drinking, they lost their flesh, they bled, they tell all their tortures, which sets in motion a new movement completely contradictory to the first interrogations, which is that the Templars admit none of the faults they are accused of, because they say that these are false accusations. Little by little, the defense of the Templars is organized. Faced with the increasing number of members of the order who retract, Philip the Fair and Guillaume de Nogare decide to strike back hard. Philip the Fair, his legal experts, seized upon this, saying that these Templars who had confessed had been reconciled. And now that they denied, they have thus relapsed. They return to their heresy. And for returning to their heresy, they deserve to be burnt at the stake. In May 1310, 54 Templars who retracted their confessions were sent to be burned at the stake at Port Saint Antoine in Paris. The movement to defend the order of the temple, launched by the Templars individually, stopped overnight. The threat of burning Templars who would retract their testimonies had worked, 
a produit ces faits. No one wants to defend the order anymore. De l'ordre, no one wants to tell the truth. Dire la vérité. King Philip the Fair had already won. Philip IV's early executions were intended primarily to bring pressure on the papacy. He was making it clear to the Pope he wasn't going to back down, so the Pope was going to have to get used to the idea that the Templars were going to be found guilty. The Templar affair becomes far too embarrassing for Pope Clement V. In spite of his conviction that the Order of the Temple is not guilty, the persistence of the King of France directly threatens the Pope's legitimacy. Pope Clement realized that the damage had been done, that the accusations were so outrageous and they'd spread around Europe pretty quickly. Everybody was in a state of shock. You can't, you know, hear the Knights Templar, the great Christian knights, the, the summit of crusading zeal, are found to be doing all of these very strange and very unchristian things in their initiation ceremonies and in, a, in their other aspects of their spiritual practice. On October the 16th, 1311, the Council of Vienna convened. Its 170 members rule on the culpability of the Knights Templar. A commission reviews all records of the trials against members of the order across Europe. But Philip the Fair aims to prevent that the Templars be recognized as innocent. He goes in person to apply pressure on the Pope. Six months after the beginning of the Council, Clement V capitulates and stops the trial. He is the superior of the order, and therefore he alone decides to suppress it. There's nothing the Pope could do, really, to save the order. I think he kind of reluctantly said, OK, you've just got to wind the order up. Clement had, really had no choice but to dissolve the order. Of course, Philip the Fair, King of France, was breathing down his neck the whole time. I think that the Pope tried to make the old affair die down. In order to do so, he had to sacrifice the Templars that were already condemned. It was more convenient for the church that they disbanded somehow. On March the 22nd, 1312, the Pope signs the papal bull, Vox in excelso, officially dissolving the order of the temple. Considering the grave scandal that all this has brought to the surface and the horrible deeds perpetrated by a very large number of brothers, I have decided to abolish, not without bitterness and pain in the heart, the order of the Knights Templar, its state, its uniform, and its name, and I subject it to a perpetual ban, expressly forbidding anyone from now on to enter this order, to wear its uniform, and to impersonate a Knight Templar. Anyone who contravenes this prohibition will incur the sentence of excommunication. Less than two months later, the bull Ad Providam stipulates the decision taken by Pope Clement V regarding the holdings of the order. All their belongings, whether overseas or on the continent, in any part of the world, their villages, lands, barns, places, rights of justice, income, and all other movable and immovable possessions that depend on the Templar houses are to be turned into the order of St. John of Jerusalem. It is therefore not the King of France who recovers the possessions of the Order of the Temple, but another religious and military order called the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. One hundred and ninety-two years after its creation in 1120 in the Holy Land, and less than five years after the spectacular arrest of all the Templars of France by the men of Philip the Fair, the Order of the Temple disappears. Two years later, the fate of the dignitaries of the Order of the Temple must be decided. Among them, Hugues de Perrault, representative of the Order in France, Geoffroy de Gonville, master of the Order in Aquitaine and Poitou, Geoffroy de Charnay, master of the Order in Normandy, and the 23rd and last Grand Master, Jacques de Molay. 
Jacques de Molay, en fait, Jacques de Molay has been waiting since his arrest to see the Pope in person. He has walled himself up in silence saying, I am waiting to see the Pope, to talk to him, to explain to him why I acted. But the Pope won't be coming. Instead, he sends his cardinals to communicate his judgment to Jacques de Molay and the last dignitaries of the order still in prison. On March the 11th, 1314, Jacques de Molay and the three other dignitaries were summoned by the Pope's men. The Templar Grand Master Jacques de Molay had been in prison for seven years. I think he was clearly an old and confused man. And eventually he was given the choice of again confess or be burnt at the stake. As the four dignitaries have renewed their confessions, they are brought to the square in front of Notre Dame de Paris to hear their sentence. In front of the population and in the utmost silence, they are officially sentenced to life imprisonment. Faced with injustice and to general surprise, Jacques de Molay then his version. He denies the accusations brought against him. Jacques de Molay and Geoffroy de Charnay both retract their confessions in the presence of the Pontifical Commission, in front of the King's men, in front of the population, signing their death warrant. Philippe de Fer, King of France, is immediately informed by the situation. Without waiting for the approval of the cardinals, he has a pyre erected on an islet at the end of the Ile de la Cité. Jacques de Molay and Geoffroy de Charny are burned at the stake that same evening. De Molay refusing to confess again and being burnt at the stake is a tragic end, but it's also hugely symbolic, hugely powerful in the sense that his willingness to be burnt at the stake. It's almost like the only thing he can do to get one over on the French king, really. This is his one powerful card left to play, is to go to the stake. On that day, the course of events is retold in a poem written by Geoffroy de Paris, a chronicler of the royal chancellery. The master has unclothed himself without any fear. They took him to bind him to the stake, but he said to them as follows, Lords, at least let me join my hands a little and to God make prayer. I see here my judgment where death suits me freely. God knows who is wrong and who has sinned. Misfortune will soon come to those who have wrongly condemned us. God will avenge our death. Know that all those who are contrary to us by us will suffer. He says that God at the end of time will recognize those who have done good and those who have done evil. He speaks before God. In other words, he also speaks for posterity, for his own, but above all, for that of his order to which he had so devoted himself. Long after, legend would have it that these words pronounced by Jacques de Molay were at the origin of the curse that would strike those who caused his fall, and that of the Order of the Temple. Jacques de Molay was said to have cursed the French King Philip the Fair and the Pope Clement, and indeed the Pope did die the following month, and Philip died in a hunting accident that November. The kingdom appeared to have a bright future, all mapped out. But what happened? The king died very quickly, and his three sons, who succeeded him, also died. And then the kingdom of France went into crisis. France, which was a military power, was defeated by England, 
And to make matters worse, the Black Plague broke out. For many observers of the mid-14th century, the Capetian kings became cursed kings. As all the sons of Philip the Fair die very quickly, it is almost like an erasing of his family, almost like a revenge on behalf of the massacred Templars. of Jacques de Molay, the sudden death of Philippe the Fair and Pope Clement V, the mysteries surrounding the birth, reign, and fall of the Knights Templar are all elements that for centuries fueled the wildest conspiracies about the order of the temple. Here we have an order that is at the heart of the relationship between Christianity and Islam for a substantial period of time during the Crusades. Here is an order which fights for Christ, which to many people seems a contradiction in terms. Here we have an order that was fairly mysterious in some of its practices. And here is an order that was ultimately dissolved on accusations of heresy. And there's a lot there that people will find intriguing. And so it's never surprised me that people do write fabulous stories about Templar myths or Templar treasure or whatever it may be. Having said that, there's very little evidence to support those myths. While some still hope to find somewhere a possible hidden treasure from the Templars, and historians continue their investigations into the secrets related to the history of these soldier monks. One thing is clear, the order of the poor fellow soldiers of Christ of the Temple of Solomon, which later became the Order of the Temple, created by a few devoted knights in 1120 in the heart of the Holy Land, will forever be a legend.